Louise to come in and present. Perfect. You want so to get set up? There she is. Hi, I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah, okay. Actually, I just want to, I'm going to go off camera as well um, as I am doing this and I'll be back. We got there in the end, fantastic. So greetings all, as um, Lisa just said, my name is Dr. April Louise Pennant and I am a research associate at the Nelson Mandela University. Thank you um, to Jesse, Christy um, and Bristol School of Education for inviting me to present my research. Um, and thank you to Lisa for chairing. So I'm very excited to share my paper titled, I was raised to understand that you have to work twice as hard to get half as far, critiquing the narrow understandings of educational success through the experiences and journeys of black British women graduates. So my Twitter is um, at April UP. So feel free um, to at me or at SOE Bristol on the hashtag blackboard white edgy space throughout as well as sharing them like your thoughts with me during the discussion after the second paper at the end. And I'll be back on camera also at the end too. So firstly, I will lay out, um, you know, what my paper is about. So first, I'm going to talk about the underpinnings of the education system by highlighting neoliberalism, capitalism, the myth of meritocracy, whiteness and anti-black racism. I will then highlight how for black women, misogyny noir and intersectionality are also key parts of their experiences. And I will then move on to discussing the manifestations of these terms within the education system and more specifically how whiteness and anti-blackness play out within it. After which I will move on to introducing my PhD research about black British women graduates and the educational journeys and experiences by first looking at what the data says Secondly, explaining how I theorize their experiences and journeys. And thirdly, I will share some of my findings. And attention will then turn to looking at the pandemic within the pandemic, or in other words, the impact of the combination of COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter while paying close attention to how they specifically impacted upon Black girls and women. I will then consider the educational disparities that COVID-19 has made even worse. And lastly, I will, I will briefly illustrate why, based on all of this, there is a need to redefine educational success moving forward. So in the introduction of my PhD research, I use an athletic analogy where I describe the English education system as a marathon, because to succeed requires understanding and preparation alongside stamina and perseverance. However, while others are running a marathon, I assert that many black women are running a 26 mile steeplechase with limited training and water supplies, resources, jumping over multiple hurdles, racism, sexism, and classism, as well as devising unconventional strategies to overcome other unexpected barriers that may emerge. Therefore, it is truly a complex and tiring feat for this group to complete the education steeplechase to become graduates. And this is due to the underpinnings of society which feed into the education system. So firstly, neoliberalism. Since the 1980s, Thatcher brought in neoliberal principles into her policies, though neoliberalism is global. Now, neoliberalism is about little government intervention and transforming many sectors, and particularly the, ed the education sector, into a market through competition and choice. Yet, according to Gilborn, a leading critical race theorist, he writes that, quote, neoliberalism typically works through colorblind language that dismisses the saliency of race specific analyses, end quote. And in England, quote, education policy has increasingly been characterized by a neoliberal perspective that actively promotes the supposed interests and concerns of white people, end quote. Now, capitalism works very well with neoliberalism due to its goals of economic growth and profit. And under capitalism, many societies, including Britain, are increasingly characterized as being a knowledge-driven economy. Now, this is highly shaped by the acquisition of qualifications, which has become a basic requirement to obtain many jobs in the labor market. However, Cleves writes that capitalism upholds neoliberal, neoliberal principles as it promotes educational reforms, particularly within the state-funded education sector that either cut costs or do not have many costs to implement, as well as policies that promote market solutions like privatization, testing, and measurement. 
He also notes that education in capitalist societies is promoted as the be all and end all as, quote, education leads to skills, skills leads to employment, employment leads to economic growth, economic growth creates jobs and is the way out of poverty and inequality, end quote. But he also highlights that, quote, decades of unsuccessful neoliberal reforms have shown this to be untrue, end quote. And this leads me to what has been termed the myth of meritocracy. Originally, the concept of meritocracy was coined by Young in 1958 to understand and define post-war British society. He created the equation IQ plus effort equals merit to show how every citizen should be judged and rewarded. However, many studies have since branded his concept of meritocracy as a myth because as Dick et al have noted, it has, quote, easily become a cover up for systems in which social inequalities accumulate, end quote. So underpinning the previous concepts is the power of whiteness globally, but in this case, we're talking about British society. It operates to exclude, uphold and maintain hegemony. It speaks by asking people that look like me, where are you really from? Despite being the third generation to be born in these aisles. It conveniently forgets this history of disrupting and benefiting from the rest of the world in which in the words of Stuart Hall, quote, we are here because you were there, end quote. However, there is currently a growing body of work which is known as critical whiteness studies. This field of study has shifted the gaze, making whiteness as a category and a resource more visible. According to Nayak, the foundations of critical whiteness studies are that one, whiteness is a modern invention. It has changed over time and place. This is evident when, for instance, groups that are now white were not historically, such as Jews, Irish, and Italians. Two, whiteness is a social norm and has become chained to an index of unspoken privileges. This is evident in the power it holds, such as no white person having to go through being murdered on camera and the person who did it facing no charges. Clearly, this is a privilege which is denied to people that look like me. Three, the bonds of whiteness can yet be broken and deconstructed for the betterment of humanity. We see this over and over again as those that do not get to enjoy whiteness or who are not seen as white are subject to many forms of violence on a daily basis. And it is through understanding the operation of whiteness that such groups can gain strength. And as Gilborn has already highlighted, whiteness is embedded within the education system. And I will illustrate how this plays out in more detail shortly. Working hand in hand with whiteness is anti-black racism. Dumas notes that anti-blackness is connected with the historical legacies of slavery where black people have never been seen as human. He asserts that the reason why anti-black racism continues is precisely because, quote, there is no clear historical moment in which there was a break between slavery and acknowledgement of black citizenship and humanness. Nor is there any indication of a clear disruption of the technologies of violence. That is the institutional structures and social processes that maintain black subjugation, end quote. Now, this is most evident via the existence of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is calling out the fact that in most cases, when Black people are openly and publicly murdered, they never receive any justice. In fact, in the 30th Amendment of the American Constitution, Black people were considered three-fifths of a person until 1868. Now, anti-Black racism is global in the same way that whiteness is. More specifically for Black women, they experience what can be attributed to the underpinnings of misogynoir as coined by Bailey, in which anti-blackness is compounded by, mis by mis sorry, anti-blackness is compounded by misogyny, which in other words manifests in, quote, a specific hatred, dislike, distrust, and prejudice towards black women, end quote. Moreover, due to the multiple race and gendered identities of black women, they encounter specific structural, political, and representational violence as exemplified by Crenshaw's term intersectionality. Now, while I discuss whiteness, anti-black racism, misogynoir, and intersectionality in more general terms, the education system does not exist within a vacuum, and therefore, all of these manifest within it in different ways. More specifically, both whiteness and anti-blackness are institutionalized. Yancey identifies that, quote, whiteness creates a binary relationship of self other, subject object, dominator dominated, center margin, universal particular. And whiteness arranges these binary terms hierarchically where the former term is normatively superior to the latter, end quote. 
whiteness cannot exist without anti-blackness because that is where it gets its power from. Nowhere is it more evident than within the education system where the overwhelming whiteness is juxtaposed by anti-blackness and is a feature that cannot be ignored. It also doesn't matter what educational institution one attends. We see it in the structures where, in a report about school choice, ethnic segregation, and how black and minority ethnic parents make educational decisions by Weeks Bernard, she highlights that there is an awareness amongst BME parents that, quote, the commitment of staff in black Asian majority schools was often particularly low in view of their perception of BME children as underachieving and problematic, end quote. Therefore, Weeks Bernard finds that BME parents that could afford to would move to areas where there were, quote, schools identified as having high achieving and by definition with a largely white pupil population, end quote. This shows the extent of school segregation and the perceived quality according to, the, to race in the UK. Moreover, race, gender and class, as well as the intersections of all, impact upon all stages of the education system, like the types of educational institutions that one has access to and attends, subject choice, exclusion, university dropout rates, and attainment and outcomes. Another way in which whiteness is maintained and reproduced in educational institutions is through policy. According to Gilborn, the centrality of whiteness is ingrained in education policy and as a manifestation of white supremacy. He argues that it is insidious, subtle, and normalized, and therefore hard to challenge. By this, he asserts that education policies work as, quote, the active structuring of racial inequity, end quote. And through implementing neoliberal frameworks, such as raising standards in schools, where the various ways that schools respond to doing so purposely place black students at a disadvantage. Now for black students, but specifically black girls and women, the importance of hair is undeniable. Yet the policing of black hair, which is often incorporated within school uniform regulations, is another area which highlights how policy can disproportionately target particular groups that uphold whiteness. This is further exemplified by the title of Joseph Salisbury and Colony's article title, taken from American, African-American legendary comedian Paul Mooney, quote, if your hair is relaxed, white people are relaxed. If your hair is nappy, they're not happy, end quote. Now the curriculum within educational institutions is another area that privileges and maintains whiteness. This is because it is, quote, a culturally specific artifact designed to maintain a white supremacist master script, end quote. And therefore the exclusion of other races and cultures, despite the important contributions that we have made is intentional. And I assert lastly, that um, black students are distinct to other ethnic minority groups within the education system, as they are subject to a particular form of racism, anti-blackness. And linking back to the neoliberal principles embedded into the education system, Hamilton writes how, quote, these contexts disadvantage groups like black Caribbean students, because instead of acknowledging and addressing historical racial inequalities, it blames attainment on the individual, positioning them as having the inability to compete with their counterparts in a meritocratic system, end quote. So by viewing and positioning black students in this way, this will inevitably translate to how they will be treated by teachers. And there are numerous studies that can attest to this. And by highlighting these few examples, it is evident to see how for black students, the education system can be a hostile environment, precisely because whiteness, either explicitly or implicitly, needs to be constantly navigated to survive and thrive. Based on all of these factors, we are left with an education system which can be characterized as highly competitive as individuals, groups, and their families literally fight to navigate and gain educational success in quotes on what is an even, which is an uneven playing field. And as exemplified by the hierarchical nature of different schools, the existence of private schools where you can pay for quality and better resources, and the stratification of different types of educational institutions, as well as different types of qualifications, you know, where those qualifications were gained, as well as who is the holder of the qualifications. In this way, obviously, there will be groups that are left behind. But that is because not everyone is meant to succeed. Though as promoted by neoliberalism, capitalism, and even meritocracy, we can all do well if we just work hard and try our best. And as you will see shortly, my research interests lie in the experiences and journeys of Black British women within this hostile and toxic educational environment. Okay, so I'm aware that was all a little bit heavy. Um, 
I wonder what some of your thoughts are. Feel free to share them with me um, by adding me or in the comment section with the hashtag Blackboard White Edu Space. I will now introduce you all to my PhD research about Black British women graduates. So for my research, I use qualitative methods to interview 25 Black British women who were all educated within the English education system from primary school until university. They all graduated from an English university between 2014 and 2017, and they came from a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, as well as ethnic and cultural backgrounds. And they have also come from a range of educational institutions, pathways and degree subjects. And overall, it was a very diverse group of women, and my findings definitely reflected this. Before we look at what my participants shared, let's see what their data says. So according to statistics, in the academic year 2018 to 2019, only 48.7% of black girls attained the average attainment eight GS GCSE score for pupils in England. This was slightly above the national average of 46.7%. However, when this is broken down by ethnicity, we see that where 51% of black African girls achieved the average GCSE scores, only 43.2% of black girls that identified as Caribbean did. Now I'm not drawing out this distinction to separate the group as the overall percentages of black girls achieving um, GCSE um, grades is not that great. I'm also bringing attention to the nuances and experience of the education system as well as different outcomes within the black group. Moving on to university in 2020, advanced HE reported that quote, within every ethnic group, the majority of UK domiciled students were female. However, this gender difference was largest among UK black students with women comprising of 60.2% in this ethnic group going to university, end quote, to study undergraduate degrees. Now, this is an indication of the commitment that many black women have to study in that university level, though the types of universities they choose are often less prestigious and they are concentrated in specific courses. And this may also be due to lower attainment at previous GCSE and A-level stages, which restricts their options. In addition, at the end of university, Advanced HE found that in 2020, compared to all other female groups, Black women students were least likely to graduate with a first class degree at only 15.2%, or a 2-1 at only 41.6%. And unfortunately, unfortunately, this data is not broken down into ethnicity. So according to the data, Black British women are in need of better support to navigate the education system as the vast majority are not faring too well. The next part of my paper will add some meat to the bones by illustrating um, the stories behind these statistics according to the Black British women graduates. In order to make sense of the educational journeys and experience shared by my participants, I employed a combination of theoretical frameworks as illustrated by this diagram. The entire research is grounded in Black feminist epistemology, which means, according to Scotland, quote, how knowledge can be created, acquired and communicated, end quote, or what it means to know. In this way, the experiential knowledge created by Black women is privileged, and therefore, all the other theoretical tools that I employ are used within the context to center the experiences shared by my Black women participants. Now, Matt describes ontology as, quote, one's view of reality and being, end quote, or what is. And so my selection of a relativist ontology acknowledges that there are multiple realities that are socially constructed and influenced largely by social, ethnic, gender, economic, and political positionalities. And I seek to understand how my Black women participants view the world and interact within it through, this, through these understandings. And this advocates that there are many views of reality and it complements Black feminist epistemology facilitating the sharing of the stories from a diverse range of Black women graduates. And in order to foreground the importance of intersectionality within the participants' experiences, particularly the role of class, cultural background and ethnicity, as well as race and gender, an intersectional approach was chosen, which brought together the distinct frameworks of critical race theory and Borders theory of practice together and within the context of black feminist epistemology. So to reiterate then, I use the frameworks in terms of how these operate according to the experiences of black British women graduates. 
The employment of Baldi's theory of practice alongside critical race theory as frameworks assisted in providing a sociological perspective when interpreting the data and articulating specific elements of the Black British women graduates' identities and how these operated within the structures of the white education system. So where Baldi's theory of practice is fo focused on the class positions and the structure of whiteness, Critical race theory assisted me in foregrounding the experiences of race and racism, which I expanded to include anti-Black racism. So moving on to sharing um, some of my findings. Um, in order for groups like Black girls and women to succeed in the education system, Deja provides um, an example. There are certain lessons I believe a Black child is taught at home that they carry with them into school. So having the lesson installed in you that you have to work twice as hard to get half as far, I've heard that from a very young age. I'm not saying I felt disadvantaged as such, but I knew that I had to put in extra work just because I knew that even if I accepted it, there are still so many people out there who see me as black first rather than seeing any value I have. So, Deja shows that before entering into the education field in broad reason terms, Deja is already socialized to understand that being black may hinder her full acceptance and the way she is able to navigate within it due to the way it is underpinned by both whiteness and anti-blackness as exemplified within previous slides. Baudu uses habitus and capitals as resources to explain the ways in which different groups navigate within the education system or field and how usually white middle-class students supported by their families use the habitus and the capitals they have, which include their whiteness and social class, um, which are accepted and help them to navigate with ease. On the other hand, when we add um, a critical race theory lens, we see how Deja is bringing attention to how her blackness devalues her and any resources she may have in the education system, as well as how her family have already explained to her the rules and nature of the game and made her privy to the fact that her reality will be to constantly prove herself by exerting much more effort to, in most cases, not get as much as what she deserves. Yet, with this mindset, it also shows that to work twice as hard for half as less is a lot of pressure and it's not sustainable because it will lead to burnout, poor mental health and well-being, which will turn into stress-induced illnesses such as high blood pressure, in which Black women do suffer from in high numbers. Now let's hear from Takara. I have so much respect for when I see black females actually pushing themselves to do better, to do more. And I feel like we need to support each other in the best way we can, because so many times, you know, you feel alienated if you're the only one fighting it yourself, the only one trying to better yourself. But actually I feel there are black girls out there who actually want to do better, but they don't know how to do better because they haven't had the right support to do better. They don't really know what it takes to do better, you know. Like I said, for me, I had to learn myself. Takara um, illustrates that she is aware of the injustices embedded within the education system that disadvantages herself and other black females. For this reason, she shares her respect for the fact that rather than just giving up, black girls like herself are continuing to push against the barriers to do what they need to do to gain educational success, in quote. Yet, she also shows that, um, that there are many black girls that are not aware of the barriers and the alienation that this can create, and perhaps frustration until one realizes and gains the support of other black girls or women who are also trying to overcome similar barriers due to the lack of support she feels is readily available. From a more reason lens, while Takara has expressed that she does not have certain resources like capitals which would assist in her navigating the education system with ease, as highlighted previously, the anti-blackness embedded into the education system, as well as the intersectional nature of the barriers, means that regardless of the resources that some black girls do have, which are used to help them to fight and to navigate, it's often not recognized or seen in the same way as the resources that middle-class white students may utilize. Moreover, the nature of the education system in which whiteness and anti-blackness prevail mean that the type of support black girls like Takara may have within the education system are often restricted or limited at best, which intentionally makes it difficult for black girls and women to thrive. 
And lastly, I will let Kemi speak about what she feels is changing for black girls and women. I feel like we are valuing our worth more. We are understanding that we can also be powerful. We are not trying to let anyone suppress us. I might live in Britain and my prime minister might be white and a lot of people around me are white. And my manager might be in a good position. I am probably doing the job better than her. All these things. But I feel like we black women are valuing it more to the sense like, look, I have gone through the education system and I have tried damn hard to get where I am. So no one is going to stop me. It's empowering because that means the next generation of black British females are also going to be that way. And they are going to improve on that and grow on that. So within her account, we see a change in mindset in which Kemi notes is happening for many black girls and women who are understanding the power of the fact that despite all the barriers and all the odds, despite the whiteness and anti-blackness, despite their multiple and overlapping devalued identities as exemplified by intersectionality and misogynoir, they still have managed to graduate from the education system. Black women have realized that it is not a small feat to get to where they have got to. And therefore you cannot hold them back from getting where they deserve as they are and have been working twice as hard. And that this will hopefully um, open the doors to future generations of black girls and women in the same way that their mothers and grandmothers have done for them. In this way, they are creating their own resources or capitals in terms of their mindset as well as strategies in broad reason terms, as well as creating their own narratives and stories to speak back to the dominant ones of whiteness, which position them, their lived experiences and their experiential knowledge as deficient and worthless. Okay guys, so I hope the stories of my participants who are all truly inspirational uplifted everyone. Um, and I hope you are tweeting your thoughts and putting them in the comments. The next part of my paper will look at the pandemic within the pandemic. So the emergence of COVID-19 pan pandemic exasperated the existing inequalities that plague society. Yet, while the impact of COVID-19 was felt widely, black communities, particularly in the US and the UK, felt it more severely and in ways that called into question the historical, differential and daily treatment experiences and struggles which can no longer be overlooked by governments. However, this was not the only deadly pandemic that was devastating black communities as evidenced by the reemergence of Black Lives Matter due to the brutal and public display of state sanctioned violence against George Floyd, which shocked and rocked the world. With, with parallels being drawn between the deadly COVID-19 virus and anti-black systemic racism that both disproportionately kill black people Many of these communities are and were living in a pandemic within a pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate death toll across many black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, which has been found by Professor Ogbonna is attributed to, quote, the effectiveness of the communication of health information, the issue of cultural suitability of health and social care services, income and employment insecurity, house and overcrowding and environment, the financial burden created by migration status, violence against women, children, domestic abuse and sexual violence, and the role of structural and systemic racism and disadvantage, end quote. And the Office for National Statistics also found that the black community were more at risk of dying from COVID-19, reporting that black men in England and Wales are three times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white men, and that black women were twice as likely to die from COVID-19 as white women who had the lowest risk of dying. <clears throat> Such disproportionate COVID-19 deaths within black, Asian and minority ethnic communities led to a growing distrust of government and public services who were clearly not providing these communities with additional help, despite clear indi indications early on of how it was adversely impacting these groups. As they wrote in her article, governments were slow to act which led to community groups like the Abele Initiative and people like Professor Ogbono having to take matters into their own hands to support Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities to literally survive, as well as putting pressure on the government to do something. It is important to know that these disproportionate deaths have literally destroyed Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And while we don't know the real impact as we are still under restrictions, I can guarantee that the impacts will last for generations. 
Now, the murder of George Floyd on the 25th of May 2020 in the US sent shockwaves across the world. This overt display of violence brought to light the structural and systemic anti-Black racism endured by Black communities in both the US and the UK. These events came on top of the COVID-19 pandemic, which was, as I have just mentioned, already disproportionately killing Black people. We saw Black pain and Black trauma played out over and over and over again by the different forms of media as people carelessly retweeted and forwarded the video of George Floyd being choked, as it seemed that they had now become desensitized to the frequent and public lynchings that we continuously see over and over again. Yet, Black people were expected to continue to go to work and school and to live like everything was normal. We saw people hashtagging Black Lives Matter and putting up black squares as their profile pictures in performative solidarity and outrage. We saw organizations and universities rushing to release a statement condoning the events, or even worse, we saw our white and non-black colleagues who discussed everything in the news completely silent. And it's because they were uncomfortable or afraid to express an opinion. And all they had to do was to check if their black colleagues were okay. But as always, we saw this melt away and little change or justice actually occurring. So if I bring this back to black women and girls, despite the fact that we too are also dying at higher rates, due to both COVID-19 and police brutality. Still, the focus centered upon black males in both of these pandemics, failing to include the plight of black females who are also enduring similar impact as their black male counterparts. We see this in the highlighting in the news of black men dying more, as well as in the Black Lives Matter movement, where for the murder, for instance, of Breonna Taylor and countless other black women victims, as Egg Buonu writes, quote, the rage lasted a few days and then quelled to a mere whisper, end quote, though it did eventually pick up momentum. Black Lives Matter has been criticized for mostly censoring the plight of black men, despite it being found despite it being formed by three black women. And this prompted Professor Quimberly Crenshaw to create the Say Her Name campaign, an offshoot of Black Lives Matter to address the imbalance and invisibility of black women victims of state sanctioned violence. In addition, a short study by the Prince's Responsible Business Network about black, Asian and minority ethnic women's mental health and COVID-19 noted that black women are more likely to have a common mental disorder than other groups, which will probably have increased with the additional stresses created by the current COVID-19 crisis. You see, black pain and black trauma cannot be separated because even though its manifestations are often framed around black male experiences, it is the black girl and black woman who not only have to deal with their own manifestations of the pain and trauma, but also bear the brunt of the destruction of the black boy and black man. And we need to do more to make sure that black girls and women are okay, so that they are not suffering in silence with the weight of the world and yours on their shoulders. Now, going back to the education system, while we um, will not know the full extent of the impact of COVID-19 just yet, we are starting to see how it is increasing existing inequalities. <clears throat> we know that black host households are most likely to be in the most socially deprived areas, and this will impact the quality of housing, as well as the types of resources that they will have access to, such as the computer and internet access, which will impact how they're able to participate in online learning. Moreover, black students are more likely to go to poorly resourced schools or under-resourced schools, and therefore they may not be able to access the support that they really do need. Additionally, due to the lack of messaging from some universities, uh, many black students, along with others, may have missed the cutoff point to the third year of their university course and so be liable to pay the whole fees despite not attending. We also saw the outrage of the algorithms that were employed to predict student grades, which are ineffective and further disadvantage particular groups. In addition, the other option was to use teachers' predictions and judgments to determine grades. And we know how historically there has been a lot of teacher bias against black students. And lastly, 
I bring attention to mental health and well-being, which many people will be struggling with in general. However, I call attention to the way that this may be even worse for black students who will most probably have had to have had to sorry, who will have most probably have had to um, have experienced a lot of death within their families and communities, as well as being witness to black bodies being brutalized on the TV. What would effects be on how they are able to study? Is this even being considered? And will black students be supported to help them to recover? Okay, so that was quite heavy, but um, it shows the reality of the times we are living in, particularly for black communities and black girls and women. And I will now move on to discussing the last section of this paper. April Louise, I'm so sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but if you could be quick with the last part, that would be fantastic. But oh, so sorry. amazing presentation. <laughs> I really hate to interrupt you, but I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, this is literally like the second to last. Okay. So based on all that I've shared within this paper, the underpinnings of the education system, how it manifests, the experiences and journeys of Black British women graduates, and the pandemic within the pandemic, we can no longer uphold narrow understandings about educational success. That is that we can all attain it with just hard work and ability. This is why I critique educational success. As I argue that the definition along with others does not consider the differing positions individuals and groups enter into the education field from or the unfair playing field, as well as the obstacles that are overcome to reach the point of graduation. The inequality within the playing field has increased more and obstacles have grown even more due to the pandemic. Additionally, those that do manage to gain the grades to, to, to gain graduate status, groups like black women are still not able to um, gain the expected opportunities within the labor market. Now, while we know that grades have not necessarily been the way to gain opportunities as Bourdieu and other scholars have um, discussed other forms of resources such as capital, which also like help, Moving forward, we need to see how um, grades could also become redundant as they may be even more devalued as a whole due to the way that they're predicted and the different ways in which they're given. So I ask you all, how can we define education success moving forward? You know, would it ever be possible to ensure that black girls and women are able to attain it without working twice as hard for half as much? And how can we better support black girls and women in the, edu in the education system in the new normal post COVID-19? Sorry that I overran. Thank you so much for listening to my paper and I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the discussion after Tino's presentation. Over to you, Tina. Thank you so much, April Louise. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, a really, really powerful presentation. Thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. There have been lots of questions in the chat so far. Um, but if we could pass over to Constantino now, if you want to share your, your presentation, that would be great. Thank you. Hello, I'm Constantino Dumangani. And I'm also going to be turning off my camera during uh, my presentation. So hopefully I'm going to share the screen first and go from there. This, can people see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, I'm Constantino and I completed um, my ESRC funded master's and PhD at Cardiff University in 2016. And I'm going to be sharing an overview of some of the PhD research, which I was blessed to publish two journal, journal articles on, one in um, the British Educational Research Journal and the other most recently in December of this year in, in qualitative research. For um, those of you who are working in higher education, um, particularly in Russell groups, I would like you to just think for a minute about the demographic composition of the students who are studying at the institutions um, where you work. Um, this is particularly uh, focused on those who are attending Russell group institutions. Just think about how many um, Black African Caribbean students do you see around? generally around campus. Um, now, I know this is difficult to do during a pandemic when you're off site, but I'm asking you to try to think back to your previous years of study or work at the institution. Do you recall seeing many or any black men like those reflected on the pictures on this slide? Uh, 
probably very few, unless you're at a London or possibly Birmingham or Manchester-based institution. And this indi indicates a, uh, is indicative of a serious inequality that has continued to occur in UK higher education. And it's part of the reason that I wanted to do this research because there was a lack of black males. And I'm not gonna say British African Caribbean for all of this, it's just too long. I will be using the term black here on in. But my, the purpose of this research was that I was noticing that there was a lack of black male representation in elite UK higher education. And the numbers were far smaller than what I was accustomed to seeing in my home country, the US, which God knows has its share of problems with race and education. But the representation again, of black students in US universities is not nearly as small. Now I chose to focus on black men because they are less represented in elite Russell groups than black women. But since I've conducted this research, I would now like to also champion a call to conducting this kind of research intersectionally, again, using Crenshaw, which my colleague April Louise has mentioned. My aim and future hope is to be looking at the issues that have been addressed, that will be addressed in this presentation intersectionally across black men and black British women and UK elite universities. And I'm speaking particularly for this presentation about UK domiciled students, okay? So today's presentation will look at the following things where Black British students were studying in 2013, 2016, when I conducted this research, and where they are now. I'm also gonna look at the benefits of studying at um, a Russell Group University and why it's important for Black students to be able to study at these institutions. I will then argue the need for narrative research inquiry, the benefits that, uh, of using this to understand um, quantitative research. Now, I was going to give a brief discussion of key terminology and theoretical in, in, um, underpinnings such as race, habitus, power, capital, racism, and intersectionality. I'm putting that on hold because of the um, time constraints. And also, April Louise has done a very good job of addressing the, some of the same issues and things that I, some of the same areas that I address as a critical race uh, intersectional researcher. I will then give you a methodological re, um, overview of the research approaches that I used, which is particularly third objects, which is in the title of this paper. And we'll look at some of the findings from my research. Where are Black and um, BME students study in the UK? At the time I was conducting this research, the Universities and College Admission Service, UCAS, found that entry rates to universities for all ethnic um, groups in the UK had been, were increasing, and they'd been increasing the most among the Black ethnic group. And Black students' attendance continues to increase through 2019, up through the pandemic. So for um, UK has some collecting data since 2008, but for almost a decade, researchers, researchers indicated that a higher proportion, proportional percentage of Black and ethnic minorities attend higher education in the UK than the proportion of their white peer group. However, on average, Black students have been found to have low entry levels into higher tariff i.e. the Russell Group universities compared to other ethnic and white groups of students. So black students are primarily concentrated in the post-1992 and new universities that have lower levels of attainment and poor graduate prospects. So basically this slide is addressing some of the issues showing where black students study in the UK. And on average, 77% of the students attending Russell Group institutions are white and less than 4% of them are black. Additional UCAS data um, that focuses, provides information about applicant school or college has been um, thoroughly um, investigated by Vicki Bolivar, Tariq Madud, Anna Zimdar Zimdars and many others. Um, and it primarily emphasizes that when university applicants from black and other ethnic minority backgrounds do apply to Oxford University or the Russell Group more generally, they are substantially less likely to be offered places than white applicants with comparable A-level qualifications. And I'm just giving you some additional statistics here on the percentage of white students who've been accepted compared to the number of Asian and black students um, 
in higher education. So the numbers are higher for Black and Asians, but the question again goes back to the issue of where they are attending higher education. And Black students are least likely to attend a Russell Group University, with only 7% of them being admitted, compared to 11% of white students, 13% of Asian students. Okay. Now, this is data from the current UCAS undergraduate sector um, level um, resources 2020, the most current that's out there. And I have this data for all BAME groups, but I extracted what I needed to speak about for Black students for today's presentation. Now, I'm trying to focus on these two columns and these two columns. So I'm showing you um, admissions in 2013-2014 compared to 2009, 20, 2019, and 2020, okay? So based on my research, I wanted to pay particular attention to Black applicants, and that's why I'm looking at the uh, Black African Caribbean and Black African applicants. So in 2013-2014, approximately 36 to 39,000 Black African pupils applied to UK higher education, of which 68 to roughly 72% were accepted. In those same years, roughly 10 to 10,400 British Caribbean pupils were accepted to UK higher education, which is about 72 to 73%, okay? But again, that goes back to the question of where these students were, um, were actually attending. But through 2015, the number of Black applicants to H higher education, it continued to um, increase. In 2019 and 2020, the number of Black African applicants has surpassed the number of submissions in 2013 through 2018. However, for Black Caribbean students, as you can see, the numbers have, um, have dropped roughly by about 1,500 students since their peak in 2014. However, still, you have a high rate of acceptance here, roughly 10% higher than the acceptance rate in 2013-2014. It's roughly 80 to 83%, okay? Now, I'm just gonna quickly look at these columns. Unfortunately, these didn't show up well. It's supposed to be blue at the top and green at the bottom. Blue is for male, green is for um, female. And what I'm trying to show is also that if you look for males in each category, except black other background, in every year, the numbers for uh, are substantially higher for the numbers of black females being accepted into higher education than black males. And that also transfers over into Russell Group institutions. Why is it important for Black students to attend Russell Group universities? Research institutes indicates that there's a substantial salary advantages for graduates of Oxbridge and the Russell Group and, um, and other highly select, selective um, universities. And that is found clearly by the amount of research output they have, the amount number of doctors that they train, doctors and dentists annually, um, and also, research indicates that Russell Group University graduates earn on average 40% more than those who have studied at other higher education institutions. So basically, with Black students only representing a small percentage of all Russell Group students, they're missing out on a huge portion of future graduate earnings. COVID, let's look at the present. What happened? Um, to black widening participation in higher education during COVID. There was a continuation of progress in widening participation with record entry levels um, here across um, lowest participating areas. And within um, ethnicity, black students re reached 47% um, level of, of entry. Um, and also 10.2% of black students um, entered with um within during this time period but again the black ethnic group remains the least likely to enter higher tariff providers again the russell group 3.9 almost four times less likely than those students who are from chinese or ethnic um, groups but some progress Black and minority students overall are, um, are make up one fifth of Oxford undergraduates um, currently. And the overall population that students admitted at Oxford increased from 2.6 in 2018 to 3.1% in 319. 
So this figure represents a rise of almost 50% since 2014 for Oxbridge, Oxford in particular, and they're quite proud of that. Let's look at Cambridge. In 2020, Cambridge admitted 137 black students out of a class of 3,890 students. And this is an improvement, an increase of 50% from the previous year when it was 91 students. Now this improvement of up 50%, and I dare say these numbers to me are still quite small, is in part um, a response to the generosity of people like grime artist Stormzy in providing scholarships for black students at Cambridge. And he's contributed to breaking down some of the barriers. Um, Cambridge has also strengthened partnerships with in initiatives to target um, to a program called Target Oxbridge, and it's providing more places and mentoring programs for Black and minority ethnic students as well. So I agree that there's progress, but I contend that these figures are paltry and that much work is still needed. Now, this is just a quick pop quiz. This was, um, slide represents the 24 Russell Group institutions. And I'm just asking you to think about for a moment, in 2019, out of all these um, universities, I wanted you to think, where do you think Bristol University, the University of York, and Cardiff University rank in terms of their admitted percentage of white students? In other words, how white are these institutions? So I'm asking you to put in the chat and I'll come back to the end of this presentation. Where do you think Bristol, York, and Cardiff rank in terms of first, second, third, fifth, 24th, in terms of how white they are in admittance? Moving on to the attainment gap. This is another huge problem in higher education, and some Russell Group universities have been found to be three times more likely to award a white person a first uh, uh, than a black student. And that is actually the situation at the University of York. But we are, but we are not alone as a Russell group um, for having that much of a disparity. Um, overall, 82% of white students attained a first uh, or a 2-1, whereas only 61% of black students attained a first or a 2-1. And according to the Teaching and Excellence Framework, the dropout rate for all UK ethnic backgrounds is 6.9%. However, for black students, one in 10 drop out of university. And in England, black students are 50% more likely to drop out of university than their white or Asian classmates. And my conclusion for this is that access alone isn't enough without support, retention, which can equal success. And we need to begin by gaining an understanding of the journeys and the experiences of black students who attend Russell Group institutions. So, I've shown you the quantitative data on the, the problem of access rates to, for black students at elite universities. And I've discussed issues of outcomes, grades and retention rates and dropout rates of black versus white students in UK higher education. I contend that there is now a need for in-depth qualitative data case studies, you could call them, that explores the experiences of the few who have succeeded at Russell Group institutions to gain an understanding of how they got there, what they experienced while attending Russell Group universities, and what they identify as resources or capital factors, if we're going to use Bourdieu, that aided them in their success through these institutions. Now, qualitative data can provide the in-depth layers of richness to help understand the why of the findings and the quantitative data that I pre 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 presented on the previous slides. Now, I'm gonna breeze through this slide, okay? Because um, this discusses my methodology and research questions, but I'm happy to discuss any of this during the Q&A if anyone's interested. But the takeaway is that I, I conducted 48 semi-structured interviews with 15 participants, and each participant was interviewed at least three times, and three were, uh, were interviewed additionally on top of that. Okay. And I had a breakdown of students who were from Oxbridge, as well as the, uh, some of the other Russell Group institutions. Now, these are some of the methods that I used to explore my participants' university experiences. Third object prompts. 
Now, these are usually tools that are used in some form of therapeutic work with children, and they provide something else for a child to focus on, which can help them facilitate a more comfortable environment and can stimulate better communication between the child and a social worker. And even though they're usually primarily with children, I thought that employing this strategy might be useful with my young adult participants by helping them to feel more comfortable sharing their personal experiences about sensitive issues that I wanted to discuss with them. And the reason that I decided to use third objects is also that during my master's, I focused on exploring the remembrances of black students' experiences in high school. I was looking at things of exclusion, discrimination, et cetera. And I asked very direct questions about, have you ever experienced you know, discrimination or a microaggression or any of these types of things? And there was always a defense or a denial of that when I asked direct questions. And I thought by using third objects, it might allow more space and comfortability to explore these areas. And if you want more on third object prompts, the, the name of the article is at the bottom. So this is an example of some of the data that I was able to um, acquire um, as a result of using cufflinks. So going back here, this student's talking about, I asked him to, um, if for a, um, a warm up, I asked students if they could choose a cufflink that represented their mother, their father, or a caregiver and tell me something about it. And this is the, this participant's discussion of his father after selecting a red ribbon cufflink. And he talks about the straight lines in it and how it looks very corporate and how his father was his first exposure to someone that had a really stable, well-looked-after job because he went out in a suit in a car in a company uh, and worked for a company. And then he also talks about how his father was quite strict and that gave him and his siblings standards that they expected for themselves. And he also went on to say things that reminded me of things that my father said to me about expectations that if you came home and you said, I got an A, a B, or even an A, he would say, well, if other people can get an A star, then you should be aiming for that. Don't work towards getting an A, try and always get the best. So I argue that a finding from this is resource capital, parental resource capital, professionalism, strictness, hard work and high expectations are resources and things that this participant has gained from his father. And all of that came from a discussion over a cufflink. If I had just asked him questions about, can you tell me about your father's background? Can you tell me uh, about your relationship with him? I do not think I would have been able to unearth the same type of rich data in the same type of format. Another example was a participant who selected a a golden knot for um, his mother and said that his father was the one who did the instructing, but his mom did a lot of explaining and reasoning, and but also talked about expectations here and also told them a lot about church, his mother did, and God. And for him, religion has been very influential in everything that he's achieved. So a finding from this was parental resources, high expectations, and faith capital. Um, and I say faith capital because uh, over half of my participants talked about faith as being a grounding resource that helped them to get on or get through higher education. And I wasn't expecting that. Okay. I think I have time to play this. Another thing that I used was a two minute snippet um, that was focused on shit white girls um, say to black girls. So I'm going to try to put this up now. Give me one sec. Okay, all right, I'm um, sorry about that. But the, um, the reason um, that, um, I used this video was that it um, allowed me to engage with these black men, but deflect or diffuse issues of talking about 
um, unsensitive issues, discrimination, et cetera, primarily because one, it's a parody of a black woman wearing a blonde wig imitating a white woman. So these are black men I'm talking to. They're removing it from themselves and seeing this in, the con in a different context. And they're also seeing it um, from the, the, the standpoint of um, the reality that um, it's a different co um, cultural context. Yet they were, as a result of that, I was able to um, gain a lot of very interesting um, data. And this, that little snippet has now been viewed by over 12 million people since it was put up eight years ago. Now, moving on to examples. Being other, standing out on a black, as black on campus. 11 of my 15 participants expressed awareness and self perception of being other within predominantly white institutions. The following two accounts represent some of the reflections of their experiences. Now, research su suggests that Black students at elite universities often experience feelings of isolation, loneliness, a lack of belonging, and insecurity when attending elite universities, which can make fitting in on these campuses challenging. Several of my participants expressed being the only one or one of only a few black British students on their program um, or in their university department or college. In fact, I repeatedly say that I was successful in, in, in interviewing the only black student accepted um, at one college um, at Oxbridge, the only black student to be accepted in that college in nine years. Microaggressions. I'll let you read, look at this, read this for a moment. Okay. Now, Franco's account reaffirms many stereotypically racist assumptions that the majority of my participants shared with me about, their, about what white students presumed all black men were like. However, Franco and most of my other participants' accounts, they did not challenge or confront the microaggressive assault, but chose to dismiss it and move on. Many participants told me things like, I haven't got time for this. I'm here to get a degree and get a job. Uh, plus, discrimination is subjective. It's a student's word of perception against um, another flatmates or pseudo friends or faculty members. But uh, repeatedly, I was told by participants that microaggressions were just banter. White people don't really mean it, and they'll never fully understand that they've offended us. In this case, my question to you is, what do you do when, the, when, when the, the microaggressor is a social science faculty member and they're responsible for causing the microaggression? In this situation, um, a student was questioned about whether he was actually attending a Russell Group institution and the actual faculty member was suggesting that instead, uh, did he attend a different school that was a post-1992? And although the student was quite frustrated by this, he did not challenge the situation. He, as it underlined, just laughed it off, even though it wasn't really funny. Many students shrugged off racist experiences from faculty. And another student um, shared a counter story of a teacher calling him tiny temper and asking him to wrap out a scientific equation to all of the students in a large, predominantly white lecture hall. Then there are ones about stereotypes, about black people loving chicken. This came up over and over and over again with my participants about white students asking them if they loved fried chicken. So again, this is a prevalence of discrimination, ignorance manifested through racist stereotypes about black ha habits or behavior. Deploying class signifiers is what I'm calling um, this one as one of the findings that I found. Alex in this situation and many of my other participants expressed a pride in their ability to speak English in a particular precise highbrow, also known as received, received pronunciation manner. 
and Alex feels that his ability to communicate in this way gained him gravitas and respect in certain environments where he feels he might otherwise have been dismissed. Now, Dr. Nicola Rollock, who's a reader in equity and education at Goldsmiths and is a current senior advisor of issues on race, racism, and equity to the vice chancellor of Cambridge University, has researched and written extensively about how black middle class people and working class um, um, people actively and knowingly deploy their capitals or class signifiers to facilitate acceptance in certain usually white middle spaces. The contention is that by deploying certain class signifiers or capitals, these black men are able to convince others that they are legitimate members of an acceptable middle and perhaps more importantly, white middle class. Now these signifiers, what Bourdieu calls bodily hexes, are deployed through language, voice intonation, and bodily demeanor. And I wanna also mention that several of my participants accounts also discussed that they dressed in a particular style as a class signifier at university in an attempt to be accepted within certain white middle class fields. So, I'm so sorry. I'm so yes. Sorry to um, I, you, you haven't recognized my five minute warning. So your 30 minutes is up. So okay. hopefully you can take a few more minutes. Just okay. To just give me about five more. It should. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So findings of the research are that third object prompts are beneficial in discussing and exposing and examining racism, classism, and microaggressions. They aided in discussions about racism as well as resources, parental and faith um, capital. Othering and stereotypes appear to be commonplace uh, occurrences. And Black males also have an, a, an awareness of being othered, which may explain why some students are, Black students are disengaged or not even interested in studying in elite universities in the first place, where they're not really welcome or there may not be many people like them there present. So just to um, assert that my findings are not old or passe, um, since they're six to seven years old, I just want to share some experiences that have been shared with me in 2020 and 2021 from Black British women who are currently attending Russell Group institutions that reaffirm that the Black men in my study, what they said in 2013, 2014, is definitely still occurring today. And these students were not even aware of my research at the time and shared these experiences with me. Of course, they've been anonymized. And I have to move on, unfortunately. Okay, there are more of them. I will stop that. But uh, in conclusion, one of the things I am saying is that there's a big challenge within universities, and that's about a habitus of denial with if, within them, uh, which both of these professors are talking about. Bourdieu says that habitus is inherently resistant to change, and it protects itself by always reinforcing its dispositions. It continues to demonstrate self-defense. Now, I put up these quotes from these professors because they emphasize the high bar involved and in even getting to a point where discussions about racism can even be had in the UK and US, okay? And furthermore, post-racial and colorblind ideologies are problematic because they lead to race-neutral perspectives that suggest that we live in a post-racial society, which in fact, we do not. So there's a need for resistance to challenge and reframe elite university habitus. There's a need for open and direct dialogue about race and truly safe academic spaces, free from penalty and defensiveness for students and staff. There's a need for white academics to be working, who work particularly in fields of class, race, gender, masculinities, to speak up about these issues and be allies, often white allies, to BAME students and staff and senior staff who have influence and an ear of university executive boards, the pro vice chancellor of these institutions, they need to recognize the need to actively address these issues and bring BAMA students to the table and academics to the table, regardless of their grade, because often the black academics are not senior enough to be at the table to be discussing these issues. And that's repeatedly problematic. And this needs to also come from students at these institutions. And it is in many cases, through campaigns such as Roads Must Fall, I too am X University, and Why Is My Curriculum White, which you can see on these slides. Lastly, the answers to your the pop quiz, how white are Russell Group universities? The three that I showed you, there are your answers. 
So I say thank you for listening and sorry I went over for time. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much, Constantino. And I think people might be surprised by those results that you showed at the end there, because a lot of people seem to think that Bristol might be top of the whiteness chart. <laughs> and no. thought that Bristol was actually at the bottom, which is a bit of a surprise, I think, will be to most people. Bristol's doing a lot of work in that area. Yeah, absolutely. But we need to do more, as always. Yep. But yeah, it's good to see, though. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if both of you have had a chance to look at the chat, but there's just been so many amazing comments and feedback about how much people have enjoyed the presentations. So I absolutely echo that. I mean, they're both just so rich and I just feel bad now that we might not have so much time for questions. Um, but let's do what we can and try and bring in some voices to this. But thank you so much, both of you. That's really been amazing.